the, the notion, that presumptuousness of, man, I can't wait to go home. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. You don't even know what home consists of. The scripture tells you eyes have not seen or ears have heard what the Lord has prepared for those for those that uh, do his will. All right. So we have to really put ourselves back into that frame of mind. It's amazing to me how now I see people six months in and their level of fear has dropped. Man, I was scared, like like terrified for the first two years. I'm talking about terrified. Of 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 messing up in this. And a lot of you don't consider. A lot of you, it's like, you know, it's like the scripture where it says because sentence for work is not executed speedily. So because you might not see an immediate judgment on it, you think like it's okay and you got away with it. You got to get that fear back in your heart and understand that it takes work. It's a transformation. And I've told you this before. You're in this six months. You're 35 years old. You had 35 years of lies of false doctrines, of living in a way that you thought was right, but that, that's not according to the scriptures, and you think six months is enough to transform? It's not. It takes a lifetime. Because even if you were to equal the amount of years in this truth that you've walked on this earth, guess what? At any moment, that all can leave you. That can slip. All right? The scripture tells you it's a constant battle. It's always going to be that way. For each and every one of us, so it says, uh, read it again. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's your reasonable service. That's the least that you can do is take the effort to fix yourself. Get yourself together. Because with that comes everything else. Then the reasonable service extends on to the different offices, the different things that we do for the body, different type of things that we bring about all right so it says that's your reasonable service go ahead now go ahead and uh, actually no let's go to back to luke 17 and read verse 20 again but go down to 21 luke chapter 17 verse 20 and when he was demanded of the pharisees when the kingdom of god should come he answered them and said the kingdom of god cometh not with observation neither shall they say lo here or lo there for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So the kingdom of God is within you. Get me uh, Micah 4 and 10. So when it says the kingdom of God is within you, a lot of you have pieces of it, right? So now we got to piece it together. It's talking about that this thing needs to be birthed. It needs to incubate and then be brought forth. So I like his answer the best because he's talking about the little pieces that everybody has, right, within them that they got to bring out, okay? You have the mass scale, but don't forget the personal piece to it, all right? Christ uses those term birth. I was waiting for somebody to kind of talk about that, being born again, birth is within you, all right? This is why I like this scripture, Micah 4 and 10. The book of Micah chapter 4 and verse 10. Be in pain and labor to bring forth. He says, be in pain and labor to bring forth. Letting you know that it's not going to be easy. There is, it's, he doesn't just say be in pain, all right? He said, be in pain and labor to bring forth. To bring forth the kingdom. To bring forth that transformation. To bring forth that change. That change that we want in the world, that we want in getting our rulership back and our place back, starts inside yourself first. Be in pain and labor. Go ahead. O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. Like a woman in travail, just like a woman giving birth. It says be in pain and push that thing out. Because you know why? A lot of times when it comes to us personally, the things that are inside of us, I, I, I often say uh, people who have an anger problem, they go to that because that's what's comfortable. That's what they're familiar with, right? It's painful to go away from that. People who are alcoholics or drug addicts, it's painful to leave that thing. Even though it's a bad thing for them, there's, they find comfort in it, 
and it's painful to let it go. This is why rehabilitation is so difficult. This is why people relapse and things like that. It's the same thing when it comes to the lust and the things that are deep inside of you. It's painful to let that go, even though it's so bad for you. All right. Read it from the top again. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shall thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. There shall thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. So we're going to have different troubles, different trials, all right? But mainly the trials within ourselves. And those things have to get right. You have to have that pain, that tribulation to put that stuff off from inside of you. A lot of you, you, you get comfortable in where you're at in this walk. And I'm talking about early on. This is why I said earlier, I said, I see people, three months, their fear just leaves them. They've learned some precepts. They have a little bit of understanding. And they don't think and they don't consider the bigger picture and the bigger scope of what we're really trying to establish. Give me Daniel 2.44. And this is going to bring home the point. The book of Daniel, chapter 2, and verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall, shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. That's the type of kingdom that we're looking to obtain. For something that glorious and that powerful, that's going to break in pieces anybody that comes against it. Do you think a Negro spirit is going to be allowed in that kingdom? Do you think an unsure, a 50-50, a 90-10, a 99, and a 1% that's still rooted in the world because they haven't done the requisite work on themselves and their own spirit is going to make it? to that gloriousness of that type of kingdom. This is why that painful process must happen first before we get to that point, before we get that kingdom that will last forever. Give me Hebrews 12, 28, or 28 and 29. You cannot have a kingdom that will stand forever against all nations and against everything, and you can't even be harmonious and on one accord within yourself. It's not going to work that way. A house divided cannot stand. Read. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reference and godly fear. And understand, when it's talking about let us have that grace, that's, that's the same thing as the mercies like we read in Romans 12, 1. He says, let us have that grace. Romans 12, 1 says, let us have that mercy so that what? You can do the work to present your body holy, acceptable, good. And that's your reasonable service unto God. The grace is there so that we can fix what we need to fix. Because once you go into that kingdom and that's established, there's no more grace. We joke and we talk about the wilderness, our heads getting cut off. There's no more grace. And the grace, because it's abound, is taken for granted. It's too much. I, I mean, again, some of y'all talk it. You have good lip service. The righteous will scarcely be saved. The righteous will scarcely be saved. And if the righteous scarcely, what's that mean for everybody else? The problem is, is when you hear that scripture, it doesn't phase you because you think you're the righteous. That's exactly what it is. It doesn't impact you the way it should because you think you're the righteous. You could be. You have the potential to be. But a lot of y'all haven't put yourselves in that place of being in pain and laboring to bring forth. And mind you, I'm not talking about the work that needs to be done about teaching. I'm talking about the work that needs to be done in you. The transformation that needs to happen in you. How can you come into this and be the same? But You're hypocritical. It's like the crackhead that gets dipped in water but then still smokes crack. Because it even goes into something as simple as your mannerisms and your mindset. So you think that because in here you adjust your behavior a certain way, but everywhere else you act like a f Negro and that you're repentant. You're a Negro with fringes, just like the brother who got dipped who's a crackhead with fringes. He's a wet crackhead or a wet homo 
You still dealing with homosexuality after getting dunked in water. You're cheapening the grace and the mercy that the Lord has set up for you because you don't see the gravity in it. You don't see the importance of it. And, and you already see yourself in it, so you think you are right. It doesn't stay in your head that there's a possibility, and it's a big one, that you ain't going to make it. And we get all too comfortable in that. Read. For our God is a consuming fire. Remember, he's telling you this because he's telling you to put it in your mind. Our God is not the God of hugs and kisses. He is a consuming fire. Give me Daniel 7 and 9. We're going to read that real quick. So you can get a description of what God looks like. And you see if that's something that you're going to want to run up to and hug. The book of Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit. That's Who talking about the most high, the ancient of days, because he transcends time. There was no time, so he made time. That's a concept that he made for us. Go ahead whose garment was white as snow, and the head of his head like the pure wool. And that's not talking about color. That, that video that Bishop was playing last week got me mad, bro. It means, it means he had woolly hair, all right? Not, not like a color, all right? He says like the pure wool. He says his garment was white as snow. I, I, well, how come he don't explain this one? Because they try to say when it says it's white as wool, they were just trying to say that his hair was white. No, all right? He said his hair is like the pure wool. Go ahead. His throne was like the fiery flame. Was like the fiery flame. Go ahead. And his wheels as burning fire. If his throne is fire and the wheels of his throne are fire, you ain't running up to that to give it a hug without getting burned. All right? Hebrew says our God is a consuming fire. And that can be for good or for bad. If you let it consume you, and let it consume the old man. Let it consume the natural man. So that you can put that old man to death daily. Then that's a great thing. All right? Or it could just consume you all together and nothing's left. You all have a choice to make in how you approach this. And how you move forward in this. Let's go back to Luke 17 and 20. The book of Luke chapter 17 verse 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Not with observation. Not with just sitting here and hearing. Not with watching the multitude of classes that we have. The week before last when I taught, I said the problem is, I think sometimes for some of you, is that there's so much information that's abundant that is taken for granted. And all of y'all are talking, oh, I can't wait for this class to come on. And I can't wait for that class to come on. And I can't wait for this class. And I can't wait to watch that one. And yet you the same brother or sister that hasn't repented of anger, lust, uh, dealing falsely, murmuring, pride, all the things that are carnal of the flesh. But you watching. Read it again. And when he demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Go ahead. Neither shall they say, Lo, he here or lo, there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. You can't say, Look, it's here, it's there. You can't sit there. But how, with so much knowledge, do we have the same problems over and over in all the congregations that we have? We have more classes available than we ever did. When I first started repenting, and we still have the abundance of the same issues going on. So, is it that the classes aren't right, or is it that the people aren't right? And I'll tell you, it's not that the classes aren't right. The classes are just fine, because if classes weren't right, those brothers wouldn't be allowed to teach. So, the knowledge that's coming out is correct. What's missing is the application of that. Y'all just watching, watching, and not doing. I'm telling y'all, it's like... It's like sitting down and watching a workout video and eating a cheeseburger and thinking like that you're going to lose weight. That's how, that's, that's how it is. Just think of that as your repentance. You sit here week after week. And mind you, I'm going to take it a step further. You even dressed in athletic wear, just like you dressed in your biblical appropriate attire. All right? And you sitting there 
you where you need to be, you're watching what you should be watching, you're wearing what you should be wearing, yet there's still no fruit that comes forth. You've yet to transform. For that brief moment that you're there listening and watching, you feel different, but you haven't taken the steps to really make that a lasting change. Because you've only done it by observing. And you're saying low here and low there. But it's within you. And you have to bring it out from within you. Give me Matthew 9.15. The book of Matthew chapter 9 verse 15. And Jesus said unto them, can the, can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the, when the bridegroom shall be taken from them. And, they shall they, and then shall they fast. And then shall they fast. Because he was prophesying of his death. And he's like, listen, I'm here now. The, the knowledge is here. Specifically what he's talking about here, you care more when I'm gone. But what he's saying is that it's going to take that mourning. It's going to take that thirst for knowledge for a time for y'all to be so thirsty, for y'all to be so hungry. And we went through that in the various captivities, all right, in, in when we were in slavery, how we were not able to read, how we lacked any substance or identity. And we went through that fast. And now we're being fed. And you know how f some people, like, if you haven't eaten in a while, right? And we usually tell y'all, you know, some people, if you're not used to fasting, you shouldn't eat too much right after a fast because you might not be able to stomach it, right? So some of y'all, y'all want to run and jump and start eating real heavily after having gone through this time, this however long you've been alive, living lies and things like that, in this fast without knowledge. So you don't know what to do with it. A steak is put in front of you, and you've never had a steak, so you don't even know where to start. It smells good. You're salivating. You think you should eat it, but something is holding you back from doing it because you're using a spoon to try to cut the meat. All right, read on. No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment, for that which is put into, for that which is put into, fill it up, take it from the garment, and the rent is made worse. So he's saying, like, you know, those of you who know about, like, uh, sewing and stuff, so let's say you got a hole in a garment, right, and you put a new piece of fabric on it, he says, that's not really a, a, a good fix. That's not going to work, right? He goes, because it kind of fills it up. It stands out. And guess what? That rent, that hole that you had in that garment actually winds up worse. Some of you operate like that in your repentance. It's the appearance of things. You cannot absorb this understanding, this knowledge, if you have yet to transform yourself. You are that old garment that he's talking about. Read on. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles. Else the bottles break, and when the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Now this one is real heavy, and it goes really into what I'm talking about being transformed. He's telling you here, this understanding will not rest in you, because you must be renewed. You must be new in order to receive this. This knowledge will not reside in you. If you continue on in your old ways, and that goes on every measure and every level, you cannot be the same person. You have to be a different man, a different woman when you come into this. That's what it means to be born again. If you're holding on to any similar, he's saying that if you put that new wine, which is what? These scriptures, this proper understanding, that power of repentance by the mercy of God in Christ, all right, into that old vessel. It's going to destroy that old vessel, and not in a good way, not in the way that we want, where that old vessel is destroyed. He says, the new wine will run out, and all this knowledge will escape you. It's like, you ever seen like cartoons or something where a skeleton tries to drink something and it just falls out all over the place? Yeah. All right? That's how some of y'all are I'm receiving this word. All right? This thing, it, you're trying to absorb it, but it won't contain inside of you because your spirits ain't right. You've not yet put on that new man. You've not yet put on that new cloth. You've not made yourself a new bottle. You've yet to be transformed. And this is why years and years will go by, and it might not even be sin. It might be, the world calls it character flaws, but we know that it's something that's detrimental to the truth. It might be something as simple as something, an error in your character that's not conducive to the greater good of what we want, to that great kingdom that'll stand forever. Again, read Wisdom of Solomon 1 and 3. 
The book of wisdom, and so wisdom of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 3. For forward thoughts separate from God. When his power, when it is tried, reproveth the unwise. For forward thoughts separate from God. Thoughts that are not in line with the scriptures, thoughts of evil surmising, thoughts of, uh, uh, you know, we got this issue where it's like people get offended when a question's asked. If you, let's, let's say, for example, you don't typically work on the Sabbath. And all of a sudden, you come to me and say, you got to work on the Sabbath. If I ask you why, why you got, you got some brothers that will give you a, an offended answer. Well, what do you mean why? Because I got to. Oh, I'm just about, bro, there ain't nothing that I should be able to ask you. That You act like I ask you, like, you know, how many times you wipe your behind or something like that. Like, yo, that's too personal. Why you, not, bro, <laughs> why? Was there, was, there, was there anything that you could have done to avoid it, to not have to work that day? And I'm using that as simple. That could go for anything. Everybody gets offended. A question's asked, everybody gets offended. Everybody goes into a defensive posture. Usually what I do, man, is I just wait. And if you just wait like two seconds, they, they come down because they realize, because they, they're ready for a fight. And they realize like, damn, I, I actually came out my face and I don't realize why. Right. Read verse four. Verse four. For... For into a malice soul, wisdom into, shall... Into a malicious soul. Wisdom shall not enter, nor dwell in the body that is subject unto sin. Go ahead. For the Holy Spirit of discipline will, will, fly de, will flee deceit and remove from thoughts that are without understanding and will not abide when unrighteousness cometh in. So that's like what Christ said. You're trying to put new wine into an old bottle. He says the old bottle will break and it will not be preserved. The new wine breaks it and then that new wine runneth out. But if you work to make that, uh, that vessel new, right? Because now with that really the bottle represents the vessel. The vessel is our bodies, our spirits. And if you work to make that vessel new, then more and more of this understanding will stay inside you. And guess what? The goal is for it to be preserved, to contain it within you. So that whenever anything comes up, you don't feel like you need to fall back onto things that are familiar. You know the way forward. You know how to deal with whatever's bothering you. And again, sin is the primary thing. But there's outlying things that you want to directly call sin but can lead to sin. All right? And this is, again, I'm talking about don't, don't um, discount the character issues that you have in your personality in this walk. And then use that as an excuse and a buffer as for why you are the way you are. All right? I'm not saying don't be you. All right? But be the new you. Be the new you that the Lord can use. All right? You can't, you can't have the... Look, I'll give you an example. Being slothful. Is there a sin that says thou shalt not be slothful? No. Right? But we know that technically that's a sin, right? Because all types of other things compound into that. All right? Having a slothful, lazy spirit. Many of us are prone to that on different, in different ways, on different occasions. Having a procrastinating spirit. Those are character flaws that should be changed and worked on. And if you're, if you're years and years in this and you still struggle with those to the extent that you did, or, or, or even by any measure and you don't know how to overcome it, then you haven't done enough changing. You have not been transformed yet. You rely too heavily on saying, I'm doing the things that say thou shalt and thou shouldn't. But then all the other things, which technically are commandments because all scripture is profitable, you kind of treat it as a lesser thing. Uh, let's go back uh, to Luke 17 and 20, and now we're going to read down to 30. Be ye transformed. This knowledge will not stay in you. You know what else that shows you? That you'll stay for a time. Some of you, some of you are fooling yourselves. You think that because you're here six months, a year, that you're going to be here another year from now or two years from now. If you don't fix what you need to fix, that knowledge will not, what you know now will not stay in you. Yes, that's it. Yeah, because he's really the one that does the breaking. And, and that symbolic breaking of that old wine bottle eventually will happen to you. And it will not be preserved. So go ahead. Now read Luke 16, 17 and start at 20. I'm sorry, Luke 17, 20. Okay. My bad. The book of Luke, chapter 17, verse 20. And when he was demanded unto of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. 
for behold, the kingdom of God is within us. The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they sh shall say to you, See here and see there. Go not after them, nor follow them. For as the light lighting that lighteth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part un under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. So he's trying to impress upon you that the day that Christ comes back, y'all not going to know. And I know we've spoken about this, right? Everybody can kind of parakeet back to me. Yeah, nobody knows the day the Lord is coming back. That should frighten you. That should terrify you. Christ didn't tell you when he was going to come because he knew that that's our spirit to be that way. And that we would try to do as much evil as we could if, if we knew, oh, he's coming in a month. I'm going to be perfect now. All right. So this is why I say it should terrify you. But y'all don't act like that. The things that I hear, the things that I witness, the things that I counsel on, or that I hear others counsel on, there is zero fear in the people. I know what, 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 how Christ felt when he says he marveled at their unbelief. Because that's what it is, it's unbelief. Because if you really believed, that would guide your steps and you wouldn't do what you do. Like Paul says in the scriptures, that which I do, I, that's which I would do, I do not. The understanding in this should keep you from doing the evil that you want to do. It should write you whenever that creep. But listen, it's going to come in your head. I've said this before. It's going to come in your head. Paul prayed for that to be taken away. And the Lord responded, my grace is sufficient for thee. Because he's saying, I've given you enough to deal with whatever comes in your head. All right? But the longer you entertain something, eventually it'll manifest. And it'll find its way. And it'll find its way. Read on. Verse 25, but first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the son of man. So he's going to expound upon that because he's using Noah as an example. And he's saying, just like the destruction came suddenly in the days of Noah, that's exactly how it's going to be here. So you're not going to have any indication, right? You're not going to hear the garage door open and know that the car's being parked and mom or daddy's home so you can stop doing whatever evil you're doing that you shouldn't be doing. You're not going to know that. He says it's going to be like the days of Noah. Read on. They did eat. They drank. They married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. And that's the level of fear that we should all have. Because it's going to be a regular day. One day you're going to be heading into work, doing your regular routine, all right? Drinking your coffee, whatever it is. And the sky is going to crack open. And Christ and all the angels are going to return. And it's going to happen so fast. But you're going to know. If you made it, you're going to know, right? Because the saints deserve to see that. And if you didn't, you're going to know and going to go, damn. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. <laughs> you, you, you know what was a prelude to that? When 9-11 happened. It was a beautiful... It was... Man, that day, I remember... It I just nice got home it from work, man. Day. It was like the most beautiful day in New York. Everything just seemed like harmonious. I know. The birds were following me singing like in Snow White. Like that, it, was like, Snow White. it was like that type of day. <laughs> yeah, Jiminy Cricket on your shoulder. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> give a little whistle. <laughs> and it was, it was beautiful, man. It was like the most perfect day. And then, boom! Everything went off, man. All hell broke loose. Okay? The news, I'm going to tell you, man, never gave justice to how bad that looked on there. I was one of the first responders. That thing was horrible. And it was like, it looked like Iraq. Okay? Like a war-torn war country. And that's the way I always imagine it's going to go down. And worse, probably. You know? And probably, of course, even worse. Because right? you got to see people getting burned up, melted. Okay, read on. Likewise, also, as it is... As it was in the day of Lot, they did eat, they, they drank, they, brought, they bought, they sowed, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Go ahead. 
Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So he gave the example of Lot. And he says, listen, man, I gave you two examples, just like it happened in the days of Noah, just like it happened in the days of Lot. It was sudden destruction. Everybody was going about their normal business, and it was sudden destruction. So we all, there's a timer on this world. There's a timer on our lives, and we don't act like it. We don't act like it. Let's read about Lot so we can put it in remembrance. Genesis 19, Genesis 19 and I want to start at 10. The book of Genesis chapter 19 and verse 10. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. So up until this point, you know what happened. The men came. They wanted to rape the angels. Um, all right. Uh, Lot went out to try to appease them. Tell them, listen, I'll give you my daughters instead. Just don't do nothing to these angels. So the, the men here is referring to the angels. All right. He's saying they were, they were two men. In the beginning, he says they're angels. Later, he says men. Then towards the end, he calls them angels again. All right. He says they grabbed them and they pulled them into the house. Read. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house. So the men that were in the house smote the men that were out. So the angels smote the men that were outside. All right. Go ahead. With blindness, both small and great. So they wearied themselves to find the door. Go ahead. And the men said unto Lot, has thou here any besides son-in-law? And daughter and, and thy son and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in thy city, bring them out of this place. So they were given a warning. All right. He said, Lot, do you have any other family in the city? He goes, if you do, bring them out of this place. All right. Because something's about to go down. Go ahead. For we will destroy this place because the city of them is waxing great. Because the cry of them is waxing great. Go ahead. Before the face of the Lord, and the Lord have sent us to destroy it. Isn't this similar to how we prophesy and what we tell people? You better repent. Destruction is coming. Christ just spoke about it when he said how it's going to go down. All right. Uh, in the days of Noah, we, all these different things, all the prophecies of it. So he's saying, right? Remember, I want you all to think. This is what happened to Lot, but it's very similar to how we roll in today. All right. Those of us who are repenting, we're trying to what? Get others to repent. We try to get your family. Who's the first people you talk to when you find out about this? Your family, right? Go ahead. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, and married his, and which married his daughters, and said, "Be out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city." But he seemed as one that mocked unto his son and sons-in-law. He says, "As one that mocked unto his son-in-laws." That's exactly how it is when we try to go and talk to your family, your friends about this, right? You tell them you're going to die if you, if you keep eating pork, you, this ain't going to go right, that ain't going to go right. And they, it, they laugh at you, basically. Maybe not to your face or whatever, but it's a joke. It's a mockery to them. This is the exact same thing that happened a lot. He went out there and he tried to warn them and he said, hey, and that's the same thing we kind of do, except it's not... Except there's no place to go except to repent so that you, there's, there's nowhere that you could go. And lots of time, you'll see later that we read, he was able to go to like the outskirts of another city and the destruction didn't touch him there. When this destruction comes this time, there going to be nowhere that you could hide. You got to be taken away in the instant that that destruction comes. All right. So then we could be put back and finish the work. So it's the same thing that, that happens with us and our families. Right. We're trying to teach them. We're trying to talk to them about it. Right. But it's a mockery to them. You got something? Yeah. Well, a lot of people overlook this when it comes to the history of of of, of Lot. His daughters were married. Which means what? Remember what happened to his wife? All right. That's symbolic of she couldn't let go of what was happening in Sodom. But more importantly, they, don't, they make a brief mention to it. Their husbands never made it because they chose sin over this truth. Oh, I'm going to take it a step further with Lot's wife. It ain't just that she couldn't let go of what Sodom is. When we talk about being transformed, she couldn't let go of the things that tether her to this earth. Just like many of you, in your slothfulness, in your procrastinating, in your attitudes that you don't want to let go, in your approach to brothers and sisters, in your approach to your everyday. Sin is the, uh, uh, the major component of it. You not laboring like you should be laboring. It said be in pain and labor to bring forth. But you comfortable, you're doing just enough. You think just enough is not enough. How about that? Read. 
And when the morning rose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here. Lest thou be consumed. Consumed in the iniquity of the city. He says, so listen, get up out of here, lest you be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Again, spiritually looking at it, it's the same thing that we're saying, and leave all those things behind. Be ye transformed, lest ye be consumed by what's to come. Go ahead. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters. The Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth, and set him without the city. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth, forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay, thee, stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. So he told them, listen, you need to get to the mountaintops, all right? You're going to be consumed. You better go. Don't look back, all right? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's how Christ put it. It's the same type of thing that he's saying here. Go ahead. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me, in saving my life, and I can cannot escape to the mountain lest some evil take me and i die he basically said listen i ain't gonna make it to the mountain all right he goes I, I, there's not gonna be enough time i'm not gonna make it there to be safe so this is what he asked go ahead behold now thy servant have thou found grace in thy sight and thou hast magnified thy mercy which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life go ahead. and i cannot escape to the mountain lest some evil take me and i die go ahead behold now this city is near to flee unto, unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a look little one? And my soul shall live. So he said, listen, I can make it to this small city, all right? And it seems to be further enough. Can I go there? And then, you know, I'll live. Go ahead. And he said unto him, see, I have accepted thee concerning this thing, that I will not overthrow this city, for that which thou hast spoken, haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore, the name of this city was called Zoror. So he told them there, and again, this is symbolic too, right, where it talks about the four winds are being held back till that number is sealed. The angel said, we can't do anything until you get out. So haste to this city. Because we can't bring the destruction till that happens. The Lord hasn't brought that destruction because that set number has not been sealed yet. All right? Again, this is all symbolic. All the themes in the Bible, they all run together. All right? It's just in different ways. Go ahead. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zorah. Then the Lord raised up Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain. And all the inhabitants of the city and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Now, yes, on the surface, right? She looked back. She was tied. Oh, the city. You know, she liked the life she had there and everything like that. A lot of people misinterpret that. All right. Let me go, let's go back to Luke 17 and start at 28. What, what, what Lot's wife did is symbolic of when Christ said trying to put a new patch onto an old garment. It's symbolic of trying to pour new wine into an old bottle. All right. Go ahead. Luke 17, verse 28. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same Day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuffle in the stuffle in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field. Let him, let him likewise not return back. Remembers Lot's wife. So he said, remember Lot's wife. 
remember that she tried to turn back, all right? She wasn't fully transformed. She wasn't fully committed in this. And this is why she turned into a pillar of salt. At the last, it goes into the, just because the angels promised him and his family salvation, they still didn't have it because she looked back. She wasn't fully committed, all right? You look at that in the spirit, and when it comes to us, and it talks about what we're talking about and be ye transformed, some of y'all are not at that point. So we got to get this presumptuous out of our head that you're going to make it into the kingdom. We don't move that way. We don't operate that way. I don't see us moving with that level of requisite fear as if that's the case. Many of us move and operate as if we got it already just because we're here. That's not the case. Remember Lot's wife. Even after salvation was promised and she was making her way away, she was far away from where the actual destruction happened. She still got destroyed. You can never for one moment think that you're okay in this walk. Read on. Whatsoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in the night there shall be two men in one bed. And the one shall be taken and the other shall be left. When it says whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it again. Going back to what we read in Matthew 9. All right. You got to change that vessel. You have to put on the new garment. You have to put on the new you. Everybody likes to talk about all things are new in Christ, but you only want us to forget that you were a hoe, all right, or that you were a, a gangbanger, right? What about all the little things that you continue to struggle with? New means new, not a little new, not like new, not slightly new or slightly used or gently used, or whatever term they use for something that's not new, but they try to pass as new. New means new. And a lot of y'all are not at that point where you're letting yourself continue your transformation in this. It's a continual process that we all have to go through. So he's telling you here, if you seek to uh, save your life, you'll use it, and whosoever shall lose it shall preserve it. Just like he said, if you poured a new wine into a new vessel, they're both preserved. So by getting rid of the old, you'll preserve the new. And you'll preserve the new for that kingdom to come and the destruction that's going to happen. Read on. I tell you, in the night there shall be two men in one bed, and the one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, and one shall be taken and the other left. Right? That's just like what he was talking about when he said he tried to go out and speak to his son-in-laws and his relatives and said, hey, get up out of this city. And they didn't go. So his whole family didn't make it. And it's also showing you here that guess what? The people that are right next to you, they might not make it either. All right? That means I could be, I could be laying in bed next to my wife when this happens, and she might go and I don't. Or I might go and she don't. All right? I'm not afraid to talk about my, my mortality. I'm included in that. Make no mistake about it. Sometimes I say, y'all, I'm in that y'all. All right? That includes each and every one of us. All of us. But just like with Lot, that's what's going to happen there. It says two going to be there, one's going to be taken, one's not. One will be left behind, one will be saved. So we sit here and we think that because, all right, we're all part of the same, you know, congregation and yeah, we all wear fringes. We all keep the dietary law with this, that, and the other. Everybody has little things that they're dealing with and that they, that they refuse to repent of or they may not repent of in time. This is where that part where he told Lot, don't haste. Don't hasten. Some of y'all are, are, are comfortable saying, well, I'm working on it. Well, it's not like it was. You need to kill that thing because there ain't enough time. The book of... Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 7. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. So and we're using Lot as the example here again, right? And he says, uh, the Most High delivered Lot. He was just, but he was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. That's very symbolic of how we live and walk today. This is what I'm saying. I said earlier that... Um, how you react to it is what's most important. But don't think for a second that none of your spirits are vexed from the filthy communication that we hear. All right? 
too much time with worldly family, worldly friends, all right? Even brothers and sisters that are not really in the spirit, okay? That vexes your spirit. You might not realize it on the surface, but it vexes your spirit. And you can get to a point where that righteous spirit just flees because it's tired of being vexed and you're not supporting it. You're not feeding it. You keep feeding the evil spirit instead. And you feed it by continuing to be around that type of communication. All right? But he says, he delivered Lot, who was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Go ahead. For the righteous man dwelleth among them, and seeing and hearing vexeth his righteous soul fr uh, from day to day with their unlawful deeds. You're, you should get to a point in this where when you see something unlawful or unrighteous, that it vexes your spirit and you're aware of it. If you're a righteous soul, that's how you know you've reached a level of righteousness. You don't entertain BS. You don't hear something and think it's okay. You say something about it. First to the individual. That's the first person you should go to when you hear something that vexes you. And if that ain't going right, then you got to take it to the next level. And then you make sure that people are aware of it. If you're righteous, when you see unrighteousness, it'll vex you. If it doesn't, you better check yourself. Read. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust until the day of judgment to be punished. But the, Lord, the Lord knows how to deliver the ungodly out of temptations. And he also knows how to reserve the unjust to the day of judgment to be punished. So this is those of y'all who, man, some of y'all be here five years and then fall into something. Ten years and then fall into something. Some of y'all will walk away from this truth and think that you're all right. He knows how to hold it, right? See, his spirit's not like our spirit. You've heard that worldly saying where revenge is a dish best served cold? None of us have that spirit on us. Because you want instantaneous judgment and revenge if somebody do something against you. This is how you get that backbiting. This is how you get those offenses when people get offended. Oh, I got to say my piece. I got to make sure. A lot of y'all don't have the ability to just let things go and realize that there's a God. But the Lord says he knows how to be patient and reserve those for judgment to that day. He knows how to reserve the unjust to that day. Right? Get me uh, Luke 9, 62. We're going to jump back and forth. So whole second Peter's, all right, Luke 9 and 62. Well, he's getting that. Remember, Judas had spiritual powers to heal, and he betrayed and fell out the truth. Did he not? Be mindful of that. Luke 9, 62. The book of Luke chapter 9, verse 62. And Jesus said unto him, no man hath, having put his hand to the plot and, look, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. No man having put his hand to the plow, all right? That's like the farming tool to get the ground ready for seed. He says, no man having put his hand to the plow. Those of you who say, hey, I'm an Israelite. I know that I got to repent and keep these commandments and that it's only for us, all right? He says, no man doing that and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Remember Lot's wife. The looking back is not just falling back into sin, but is continuing that transformation. You cannot go part way in this, right? Uh, uh, Deacon, y'all also likes to talk about how, you know, when, when you use the term stagnant, what you're really saying is backwards because everything else goes forward and you stay the same. So at some point, you're really backwards. So you wind up worse. At that moment in time, you might be stagnant, but as everything else progresses and everyone else progresses, you're further behind. You cannot put your hand to this. You cannot say that I accept this. That I accept Christ as a, as a black man. That the Israelites are the blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans. That Christ is only for us. And that we must continue to keep his law, statutes, and commandments. And still hold on to the things inside of you that you were in the world. That is not the renewing of your mind. That is not being transformed. You must let that go and start anew based on this understanding. It says you're not fit for the kingdom. That means you're doing all these different things in vain unless you get to that point where you can move past that. All right? Uh, jump back to 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter 2, verse 11. Whereas angels, which are greater... Actually, I'm sorry. Start at 9. Start at 9, yeah. yeah. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation 
and to reserve the unjust until the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. All right. It says, but chiefly the ones that will be punished are them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. So I'm not talking out my behind when I say being transformed just doesn't deal with just the sin only. It's talking about anything that's walking after the carnal self. All right. Anything that doesn't put you in that frame of mind to be in pain, to labor, to bring forth. To bring forth what? Repentance. Through faith and your works. It's faith and works. A lot of y'all are just operating on faith and not enough works. You need the right amount of each to make it happen. All right? He says, but chiefly those that despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. I've gone over this in a different context, all right? But it still falls into the same thing because I'm telling you, every camp has like this murmuring. And that's not everybody, but there's people in there. Let me, let me, let me say it like that. It's not every camp. There are people in every camp who have this type of spirit. And it says those people are going to be reserved for judgment. Get me Jude 1 and 8. We're going to jump back and forth between 2 Peter and Jude. We're going to start at 1. We're going to read down to 8. The book of Jude, verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So earnestly contending for the faith, yes, that means standing for the Lord. If you hear something that's contrary to the doctrine, standing for the Lord. But you contend for the faith by the mercies, like we read in Romans 12.1, by working to present yourself holy and acceptable unto God. By being transformed by the renewing of your mind is a form of contending for the faith. Because what you're doing is those who mock you, you're showing that you can change. That this scripture is powerful enough to elicit that type of change in you. And in that day, if they don't repent, first of all, you don't know if they might repent years from now based on your example. All right. But if they don't repent, don't worry. In that day, they're going to remember that they had a chance. That they had a chance and they didn't and they didn't get it. So you make sure you stay the course and contend. Go ahead. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God, our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's telling you that there's always going to be people that are going to creep in and they're unawares initially. Initially, they're unawares. Eventually, stuff gets found out. But it's telling you that you're not going to know. It could be the person that you talk to all the time. That is this person reserved to condemnation. It could be the person that you chose to be your chief counselor. That's reserved to this condemnation. And it says that they've turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. And they've done that because they've taken the opportunity to become new. And have either only done it to a part or done it falsely. They have not fully committed to that full transformation that needs to take place. You're resisting the change that needs to happen. And I'm telling you, things get a lot easier if you just give in, right? I don't know, Star Trek, right? The, the Borg, resistance is futile, right? It is because you're going to have destruction or reward from it. So resistance, you're, you're resisting to death, literally. You're resisting to death. So resistance is futile. And what you're doing is you're making a mockery of the grace if you're playing around with taking those next steps to really change yourself. All right? Read on. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once, once knew this, how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not. There's that example again. Lot's wife was given salvation. She was away from the destruction and still got destroyed. So now he's giving you more historical examples. He says, hey, those of y'all that came out of Egypt, many of y'all turned back to wickedness and y'all got killed in the wilderness. You were promised salvation 
You were saved from a captivity. You were promised if you do what I told you to do, you would have this kingdom and this land. But guess what? They got put to death. He's trying to impress upon you the uncertainty and the non-guarantee that you have in this if you don't stay the course. It's a conditional relationship that we have with the Lord. If you continue on in this path that I've directed you and given you the guidance in, then you will be saved. But guess what? You got to keep your pedal to the metal until I come and stop that vehicle. You will never hit the brakes. I'll hit them for you. That's how you got to look at it. So that means you could see, you could be going like 100 miles an hour. You see a wall or a cliff about to come off. You better not hit them brakes. You better keep going and have the faith that the Lord is going to take you and save you. All right? Don't take that too literal. You got some weird people. They're going to drive towards a cliff. <laughs> Man, I was doing 100. Captain said, I got to be careful, bro. I can't. I can't uh, underestimate, you know, overestimate our people sometimes, <laughs> right? So I got to be careful with that. All right, so he's giving you the example in Egypt. Read on. And the angel which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he had reserved in everlasting chains under darkness until the judgment of the great day. Let me stop there for a second because people are going to get confused with that. Brothers, what is that talking about? Verse 6. The hint is it's another historical example. And if you don't know, that's fine. Genesis 6. And start at 1. The book of Genesis chapter 6 and verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. And daughters were born unto them. That the sons of God saw daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives of all which they chose. Right? So everybody, you know, in the world, they tell you the sons of God, oh, you got Nephilim and it's angels that came down. When you read in Jude 6, the angels which kept not their first estate, he's talking about us being the sons of God. So you were partially right in our first estate that we were meant to be gods. And he's saying what? We left our first estate, left our own habitation, and we started to lie down with the sons of men, with the women of, of the sons of men. All right? Read on. Verse 3. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for he also is flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. Go ahead. There were, gi there were giants in the it's, earth it's in that those you days. You got that old English Bible, bro, and, yeah, and yeah. the letters are all different. Yeah. That's why you're <laughs> jacking the guy. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men and bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Go ahead. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. All right, stop. Now let's go back to Jude and read uh, verse 6 again. The book of Jude, verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he have reserved unto everlasting chains under darkness until the judgment of the great day so he's giving you an example and he says we know that we were reserved we were called the sons of god we were reserved unto greatness and to be immortal but in leaving our habitation by having children with uh the daughters of the sons of men we left our habitation he says even though they were promised salvation they were given that thing because of what they did they reserved those, those spirits that did that are reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of that great day. That means those spirits are spirits that are not going to make it. Shalom, Israel. I'm Elton Nathaniel, Israel United in Christ. YouTube likes to shut our channels down, as some of you have noticed, <laughs> ever so often. Subscribing to join IUIC will assure you will always stay connected to our YouTube accounts. We want to do our best to make sure this truth gets up. Please click and join our subscriber YouTube channel called Join IUIC to stay linked to all of our videos. So again, Please make sure you subscribe to this Join IUIC channel to get your latest updates on all our YouTube channels. Shalom.